Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that, at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. All right, hello, everybody. Allison is my guest today, and I'm really, I say this every time, but I'm actually, I actually am childlike excitement every single time I record one of these because I think they're really fun. But Allison is our first person on the show who is raising children but is not a parent. So Allison is a very involved aunt. And her sister, who lives down the street from her, is married, but her husband is on the road a lot. So Allison and Allison's mom have really stepped in and, I mean, you're, what are you doing? You're doing soccer and drop off and everything else, like as much. You're like the third parent. So thank you for coming on today and being of our first. Of course, I like to consider myself super auntie, so I'm I'm happy to be involved in this sort of thing. You are super auntie. I'm just going to dive in because this story needs no intro or explanation. Um, people may have heard the story before, but we're going to take a very different angle um, when we describe it because I think. This particular story should be our landmark for how we change the way we think about how people become criminals. Yes, we talk a lot about how to get them off that trajectory, but let's talk today specifically about one of the very important ways they get on it. First, we're going to talk about this poor gentleman who was killed. Chester Dean Dyer was his name, and he was fun, affable, 42 years old. He worked at a local health club. This is in Phoenix, Arizona. And he was flashy and kind of knew everybody. Everyone loved him. And he had a habit of picking up other men by flashing wads of cash at them, which kind of just drummed up this fun little picture. You know, he's really outgoing, is extroverted. And on December 13th of 1989, Chester met a man at Burger King. And they had a conversation. I don't know what was said. But this man accepts Chester's invitation to come up to his apartment. And they spend the evening together drinking beer and having sex, allegedly. Chester shows up to work at his health club next day, and he's beaming. He's got that, you know, morning glow, and he's all excited about this man he just spent the night with. And he's talking about this guy he met. He picks up his paycheck that day, and that will become important. And he asks his coworker, Michael, if Michael thinks he can help get this new guy a job, this guy he just met and was, was with the night before. So Michael agrees. I don't know what was exchanged between them, but he agrees. And he actually speaks to this, this man about possible employment. But Michael's impression was this guy has no interest in having gainful employment. He, he turned it down. He wasn't interested in it. Two days later, friends of Chester become concerned because they haven't heard from him. And I kind of described he's a social guy. He's, you know, everyone knows you're, he's, you can tell if he's missing. And so they become concerned. And then on two, December 15th, which is two days after Chester met this new man, his body was found mm. face down on his bed. Chester's in a pool of his own blood next to a half-eaten sandwich. What? He'd been strangled with an electrical cord. And he'd also been um, bludgeoned with a blunt instrument. He has puncture wounds and facial lacerations, and he's a mess. He's a bloody mess. Who found him? W uh, law enforcement, because his friends alerted oh, them. welfare check. Okay, yeah, you know, he, he didn't come to the health club. And like I said, like he's not right. one to not show up. Oddly, and this is weird, and this is a strange little maybe clue, maybe not, there was a pack of sexually explicit playing cards, and they were strewn about the place. But somebody, somewhat maliciously, whoever was there, had placed the Ace of Hearts Club on Chester's back. Ugh. And then, like I said, the remaining pornographic cards are just kind of strewn about. Uh, investigators, people looking into this, described the apartment as being ransacked, like somebody was looking for something. Closets and drawers were open, newspapers everywhere, clothes. An open five-pound bag of sugar was littering the floor, and blood spatter. And, you know, that place is a mess. 
Dyer's last paycheck, the one that he had just picked up two days earlier, was not there. Noticeably Ooh. not there. But what was there was a creepy, bloody footprint in the sugar on the ground. On December 20th, just five days after that, a man named Jeffrey Landrigan was arrested on charges unrelated to the murder of Dyer. Not exactly sure what he was doing, but it will, he doesn't obey the, the law often. While he's in custody, the police start asking him about Chester's death. And Landrigan claimed that he had no idea who Chester Dyer was. He'd never been to his apartment. But Landrigan's fingerprints matched those at the apartment. And his sneaker matched the shoe print in the sugar. Oh, okay. Because I was going to ask you, could they tell when they found Chester how long he had been dead? I think they could. They knew it. Well, uh-huh. well, they, they have a timeline. They know that he was alive two days earlier. And then, oh, you right. know, the crime scene itself will give clues. So a day. Yeah. Yeah. But, but wait, it gets better. <laughs> so not only is it shoe print and his fingerprint, um, he's wearing the victim's shirt. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think. Is this not supposed to be on World's Stupidest Criminals? I just kind of feel like if you are cruising around town after you've killed somebody, like maybe don't zip around in a shirt. Was it a clean shirt at least? Was yes. It like blood yeah. It was, okay. He took it out of the closet. He took okay. it out of the closet. And then an ex girl. Did he leave his own bloody clothes there? I think he just kind of thought he saw a cute shirt when he was robbing the place. And he was like, but I kind of. Got the image that maybe he just like was shopping and he, right. because he, he took other stuff, you know, he took the paycheck. He's kind of on his own. He doesn't have a lot of stuff. And in my brain, I'm making it up, but I'm like, oh my God, he's actually like wearing it. Like it's fashion. You'd think you'd take right. it off after you've gone home and or wherever you go and get rid of your own bloody clothes. And then you take off the victim's clothes. And do we know if, is this like his first, oh, like violent accusation? You think I'm going to just give you that now? You don't think I'm going to make you wait for that? <laughs> I, I'm that person. You can't, no, nope, can't do it. Okay, I'll speed it up. <laughs> well, police know that they have the right guy. At least they think they do because Landrigan's ex-girlfriend testified that right around that time, right around Christmas, just a little while after, in a conversation they had on the phone, Landrigan just kind of mentions casually that he killed a guy with his hands a week before, <gasps> and he was making a living by robbing people in Phoenix. Like, who said okay. Who's like, hey, Merry Christmas. I killed a dude. I'm robbing a bunch oh. of other people. I just feel like she, he should have also mentioned that he's an idiot and wore the shirt. People brag about the strangest things. Uh, yeah, and he wouldn't be the first murderer to do that. Right. So on June 28th, 1990, this is six months later, Landrigan was convicted of theft, second-degree burglary, and felony murder for having caused the victim's death in the course of and in furtherance of a burglary. So that's kind of, that, that always ups the ante if you kill somebody in the middle of an armed robbery, if it's a furtherance of that crime. And did he confess or they just had enough proof? They just had enough evidence. And while right. Landergren's lawyers argued that there wasn't enough evidence to find him guilty of the burglary, the state explained that the fact that the victim, this is a quote, was found on his bed fully clothed next to a half-eaten sandwich suggests that he was killed before the apartment was ransacked. Any other conclusion would require an inference that the victim entered his apartment, found it trashed, then calmly made himself a sandwich and sat down on his bed to eat it. So <laughs> that's how they got away with the charges that they added. And right, those charges right. carry a heavier weight. Right. So who is this fine fellow, Jeffrey Landrigan, who's walking around eating food and killing people and wearing their clothes? He's an interesting, he's one of the most interesting criminals you're going to hear about. Jeffrey Landrigan was born in 1962. He didn't know his biological parents. That's important. His mother dropped him off at a daycare at eight months old, and she just never came back and picked him up to pick him up. Oh, wow. It's kind of rude. Yeah. Um, so Jeffrey, but luckily, this is probably the best thing that, that could have ostensibly happened to Jeffrey because he gets then adopted by a wonderful family. Oh, good. He ends up in Oklahoma um, with this this family. They were kind, educated, completely rule abiding. Um, his mom was named Dot. Like, I mean, you, you cannot be fabulous if your name's Dot. She was so s- totally super attentive yeah. mom. His dad Nick was a scientist. He's a geologist, and his older sister Shannon. Now, Shannon is not Jeffrey's biological sister. No one disputes that Jeffrey's upbringing was warm and positive. Landrigan's parents knew he was different from a really early age. He would have these epic 
tantrums, complete inability to control his emotions. And they're comparing that to his sister, who's, you know, perfectly behaved in school and at home. So as we see, the physical outbursts continue, and this is common with most conduct disordered children who are on their way to criminal adulthoods, the behaviors, they ramp up, they, they, they're linear and they worsen. But I have a question. Yes. They must have had that period. Again, my niece and nephew, boy and girl, girl was first. You do have that difference very often where you're like, oh, the girl was so calm and quiet and the boy is just a spaz and people just tend to say, oh, he's just being a boy. So at one point, they probably see the signs, right? That this is not just boy. I think they probably sat with it, you know, two years old, three years old, four years old, thinking, you know, he's he's a boy. He's younger. Exactly. Maybe Shannon did this too. We don't remember it. Yeah. but it, I would. Yeah. No, it's true. It's I, yeah. I had a girl first and then a boy. And my boy's pretty calm, as you know. But he's uh, certainly moved a lot more. He moved around right. a lot more. Right, right. Well, but then at 10 years old, Landrigan begins boozing it up. He starts drinking. Yeah. So he's in this straight laced house. That is the word I saw written three times about this family. They're straight laced and he's, you know, drinking at 10. Did he, where does this, where did he even learn this? Like why? Well, I don't don't think he did learn it. And here's why. The next year he's arrested for burglary. And at 11. Yeah. Okay. So soon as you'd guess, he's in the spiraling decline that we've seen with so many violent criminals And his trajectory included truancy, then drug addiction, multiple arrests. I mean, he's all, he's just in and out, in and out. And in the middle of this, he also gets his girlfriend pregnant and has a daughter. At what age is this? This is all from 11 years old on. And I think he has the baby when he's around 20. I don't really know, but it's it's around 20. But then the unthinkable happens. Landrigan and his now wife, he marries this girl and his daughter. They're all hanging out at a mobile home park. Um, I think it was Dewey, Oklahoma, with a group of friends. They begin drinking whiskey and smoking weed. And I have some sources who say it was going to be this night that either Landrigan or his best friend from childhood, Greg Brown, were going to ask each other to be the godfather of their respective child. So either Landrigan was going to ask Greg Brown to be the godfather of his daughter, or Greg Brown was expecting, I read, a son and was going to ask Landrigan. But the opposite of that happened. They actually start heckling each other as they're getting more and more stoned and drunk and um, calling each other punk. Now, Landrigan's been in and out of the system, and punk can mean a different thing in prison. It can mean you're about to become somebody's sexual exploit. Yeah. Okay. So I, know that. I, I, I have read it before. I read it in this case. I didn't see it in the trial transcripts. So okay. I'm not sure it happened. And that's what's when you dive into a murder, if you're not looking at trial transcripts, if you're not looking at police reports, if you're not looking at interrogations, you can't say for sure. But I'm trusting that the sources that I looked at had some right. information. I, I read that, that that's a thing. Okay. Then they get into a physical fight. And Landrigan stabs his bestie. <gasps> Brown in the chest and kills him. On the same night, he was going to ask him to be the godfather of his child. In the same night, one of them was going to ask to be the godfather so of his child. So this was just, as you've, as I've heard your other podcast, this was cold-blooded. This was a... Well, I, mean, sorry, I, I call this hot-blooded. Warm. Yeah, this is a this hot-blooded, is a can't control myself, my temper. Right. And, and drunk. And drunk. And stoned. Got it. Okay. Even in trial, Landrigan cannot get out of his own way. He's interrupting his own defense counsel, who's trying to defend him, and he's interrupting him in an effort to, like, he's trying to say, look, this was self-defense. They were already in a physical altercation. And Landrigan's like, nah, nah, it wasn't self-defense. I killed that dude. Like, he's not helping himself in any way. So Landrigan was originally sentenced to death for that murder of his best friend. But it was overturned, and he ends up being sentenced to 20 years in 1982. In Oklahoma? In Oklahoma. Okay. So now, fast forward four years, it's 1986, and while incarcerated, Landrigan attacked a fellow inmate and brutally stabbed him over and over and over again. Oh, wow. Okay. Interestingly, when appearing in court, again, Landrigan undermines his counsel's attempt to mitigate the defense, like mitigate the the action by calling it self-defense. He he interrupts. He's like, no, 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 no. Same thing. I stabbed that dude so many times. He's lucky he didn't die. And so, of course, he's convicted of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. He's just not thinking clearly. So now here we are. Landrigan has killed his best friend, nearly killed a fellow inmate. Guess what he does next? 
uh, kill somebody else. No, he escapes. He escapes. How? This is going to piss people off. <laughs> I do not know exactly how this came to be, given the brutality and impulsivity of his crimes. But somehow Landrigan gets placed on a minimum security work crew. Wait, do we know anything about him at this time? You know, I've heard you call some of these people are charming. So is he just, like, nice to guards and is doing well in prison and that's how he ends up there? I'm going to go with hell no, because he's okay. he's the same guy who's having outbursts in court. Okay. So right. I'm going to say there's not much charming about this guy. Okay. I don't think he's working the system. I don't know how it works in, in that particular prison or maybe, I mean, he certainly hasn't had a lot of good behavior in prison. Right. So okay. I don't know how he ends up on this um, minimum security work crew. Bad systems very much bother me. You know, and, and maybe it's been fixed and maybe it was an accident. I don't know where it came from, but evidently while working in the park, unsupervised, he, made a, <laughs> he met a lady friend. And then it was reported that he would sneak away during these work sessions to go have sex with said lady friend. Wow. I feel like that's a lot of freedom for somebody who's brutally murdered two people. Right? Well, on one of those occasions, on November 11th, 1989, Landrigan just up and left and never came back. He escaped from prison, headed (sighs) to Yuma, Arizona, possibly to locate his birth mother. Of course, this is the point where he ends up in Arizona and he... It kills Chester Dyer. Was Chester the first in when he got to Arizona then, as far as we know? As far as we know, that's his first okay. kill. I, okay. He claims he was robbing when he got people, to but that was the first okay. kill that we know about. Got it. Okay. So let's go over his trial and sentencing. Landrigan, as smart as he is, refused a plea deal and decided to stand trial instead. I was not his jury consultant. We can say that. <laughs> as expected, he was unruly in the courtroom, and he got in the way of all of his own defenses, and he even prevented his adoptive mother, Dot my favorite, and his ex-wife from testifying on his behalf. So they were going to be testifying for the defense. And he's like, no, I don't want it. I honestly think he was like, look, I can't make it out in the real world. He said uh, he said something along the lines of, so his defense attorneys actually saying to the court what those two witnesses would have said. And Landrigan right. said, hey, if I wanted that to be heard, I would have had my mom and ex-wife say it. Oh, So he's really not... not wanting not i mean he's he's not trying to get out of this on june 28 1990 landrigan was convicted of burglary theft and first degree murder first first yeah because of the way he killed chester dyer okay the judge she was contemplating life in prison versus the death penalty for him but then landrigan gets up and he says you know what if you want to give me the death penalty bring it on i am ready interesting and he receives, What's, yeah, and she does it. She goes, she says, okay. Well, I don't think, I don't know if that had anything to do with her decision making. Right, right, right. She's a sophisticated judge. I'm not, I doubt she's like, okay, dude. I think, you know, she was <laughs> contemplating that decision, but it's interesting that he said, I'll take it. Okay. So he did end up receiving the death penalty. And interestingly, now that retired judge, when she hears what you're about to hear, said, had she known it, she would have given, probably given him life in prison instead. But to death row, he goes. But here is where things get really weird. You ready? Hang on to mm-hmm. your hats and glasses. While mm-hmm. Landrigan is sitting on death row in Arizona, a fellow inmate comes up to him and it's like, I, I got to tell you something. I spent time with this con man criminal on death row in Arkansas, where I just was transferred from. And he looks exactly like you. He is your twin. He is your spitting image. And Landrigan's like... Adopted! His name was Daryl Hill. And this inmate's like, I, I cannot, he's gobsmacked by the similarities. And Landrigan's like, Daryl Hill? You know, you can guess what's going on here. Daryl Hill, who is sitting on a different death row in Arkansas, is the freaking biological father of Jeffrey Landrigan, oh, who is father. sitting on death row in Arizona. Oh my God. Gives the new meaning to like father, like son. But these yes. two humans... Had never met each other. They'd never spent time together. I mean, and the father was also on death row. Death row and death row in two different states at the exact same time. What? And they'd never spent time together. At one, when when Landrigan was very first born, within the first few days, his biological father Daryl Hill had met him, but then I never saw him again. I mean, what are the chances? Whatever similarities we're seeing between them, that's happening between them, it's not the fault of shared environment because they didn't share any environment. It's not the fault of abusive abusive parenting because uh, Daryl was never around to abuse 
Jeffrey. He was, Jeffrey was adopted away. And it can't be behavior modeling because, you know, Jeffrey Landr- Landrigan is off with the Landrigans having a wonderful life. And this dude is doing what he's doing somewhere else. So is it just a coincidence? Nature versus nurture. Well, here's the thing. The similarities didn't end with their looks and their <laughs> current living arrangements, death row. They Obviously. had almost identical childhood trajectories into violent crime. They both started on this criminal path at a very young age. And by the way, when you start really, really young, usually your trajectory is really bad. But we have talked about different ways to intervene when you see it. And you can knock them off the trajectory in some cases. So they both started super young. They they both, um, I mean, I don't have any information about Hill's upbringing. I I have reason to believe it was not great. But Landrigan's was innocuous, if not perfectly warm. Right, right. They both started using drugs really early on. They had both killed not one, but two humans, and they had both escaped from prison. Oh, dad did too? Dad did too. I'm telling you, not everyone escapes from prison. Well, not everyone kills people, and then not everyone (laughs) kills another people, and then not everyone kills those two people and then escapes from prison. And I just said- And was it an Oklahoma prison? Because I'm starting to see a theme here. He's in Arkansas. He's in Arkansas. okay. But that doesn't Hmm. mean he didn't kill elsewhere. Right. But wait, there's more. Landrigan's biological grandfather, which is this biological dad, Daryl Hill's father, was a violent criminal too. Michelle, is there a murder gene? We'll get to that. This fine fellow had spent years incarcerated and was ultimately killed in a police shootout after he had committed armed robbery in a high-speed chase. Wow. Now remember... Jeffrey Landrigan, the murderer we're talking about today, had never met either of these men. Right. No, there's no murder gene. There is a heritability. Um, okay. Likely a cluster of genes leading to traits. We're not talking about it yet. It's jumping ahead. But there is this one funky gene that I'm going to cover, I think, in the next episode that all by itself can lead to violence, but not, not like this. This is yeah. not one gene going from one son to next son. That's, this is... This is genetic, but it's a different trans- okay. transmission. So somewhere else in their genetics. Well, it's okay. just a combination. So I believe Landrigan communicated with his biological father, Daryl Hill, before his execution. Um, it, I did not see that in court transcripts or in, in like any videos or anything, but I, I'd read it in other publications. So I believe it's true, but I, you know, I'm always a little bit more nervous when I haven't seen it from an official source. Um Neither here nor there. Interestingly, Daryl Hill, his biological father, does not end up getting executed, but dies of natural causes in 2005. Oh, okay. So they knew about each other and they knew that they were related. Yes. Yes. They definitely knew about each other. And I believe they actually corresponded. Okay. Wow. Um, Wow. Now, Landrigan's own execution had some problems. There was holdups because of some legal filings that were going on in Arizona at the time. Right. And then there was a shortage of sodium thiopental, which is the drug that's used in the injection. But Landrigan, Jeffrey Landrigan was finally executed by lethal injection in Arizona on October 26, 2010. Oh, wow. Okay. You might be wondering what happened to Jeffrey Landrigan's daughter. Oh, I right. was, and I hadn't seen much about it, and so I did some digging with names and connecting the grandparents, and I just read that her name was Nicole, and she was killed by a train when she was 32 years old. Oh, my goodness. Had she been leading a stand-up life it, up to that point? Well, it was hard for me to say. It didn't, I didn't get that much information. I noticed that one of her children had Jeffrey's name in his name. Like, oh. yeah, um, Jeffrey and the bio mom and the adoptive parents were all listed as relatives. Um, And the story that I read was that she was walking down the train tracks um, and that a train was coming, a slow train, you know, like the slow motion, like slowing down, but it's still so heavy that you have to get out of its way, even if it's moving very slowly. It alerted her. She saw it. She moved out out of the side, like to the side, but not enough. Far enough. was, Was killed. Everything else I read was just like she's the happy, sweet person. But I, I wonder if there was some trouble because of how she died. Right. That um, doesn't sound like it. Yeah. I, 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 but I that she is tried to avoid it. Speculation. It literally right. could have been she thought she got out of the way and was just you know walking down the train tracks and thought she got out of the way. So I don't I don't want to say neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, and do you know Michelle? Did she stay with her biological mom? Like was she still raised? Yes. By? So she was okay. raised by and ended up with other siblings too. Okay. All right. Yeah. So she remarried that 
girlfriend. I don't know okay. if she remarried, but I know she had other children. Got it. Okay, Allison, what does this all mean? It's a crazy, crazy story, right? Yes, it is. Um, you know, the murders themselves are interesting, but just what are the freaking chances? <laughs> so we all know that upbringing affects who we are. And it's likely a combination of genes, environment, and the interaction between genes and environment. But what this fascinating case study tells us is just the genetics influence on crime. But, of course, a single study is not enough for us to make any overarching conclusions. Um, But it's incredibly important, you know, because you see that and you can't ignore it. And a lot of researchers, myself included, have studied it in various experiments, hundreds of experiments, before and since the Landrigan case. And that's not because we're all convinced that violent crime is the only only caused by genes and, you know, it's all predetermined. No, we know it's caused right. by genes, biology, either in utero or illnesses, et cetera, and environment. Okay. In his particular case, there's not uh, any evidence of an environmental influence. But remember, these are population statistics. When I'm right. talking to you about what we find, it's not usually um, – anecdotal. You have to study it with massive amounts of people and yeah. in several different settings, different populations to really try to understand. And I'll tell you what we know. So have you researchers found a larger pool of Landrigan-esque humans? Funny you should say that. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of resistance when we talk about genetic predispositions to crime. People hate it. And they hate it because it challenges everything we think we know about raising kids, about what to fear, about having control over our own destinies. But before we dive in, I propose this. In order to isolate the most important environmental factors that influence violence, shouldn't we first isolate the genetic factors? Because that way we know which parts of the environment to change. Yes. Plus, it's a good way to select a mate. Like, you kind of want to (laughs) know. For sure. I want to tell all of you about this incredible new service I found called FrameBridge. FrameBridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things without ever leaving your house. Add a gallery wall to your home office or plan out a few custom gifts for wedding season. From art prints and posters to the priceless photos hiding on your phone, you can frame bridge just about anything. Here's how it works. You go to framebridge.com and upload your photo. Then preview your photo online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. Then choose your favorite frame or get free recommendations from the FrameBridge designers. Then the experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your photo and deliver your finished piece directly to your door. If you happen to have a physical piece you'd like to frame, FrameBridge will send you special packaging to safely mail them your items for custom framing. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a typical frame store, FrameBridge frames start at $39 and shipping is always free. Plus, my listeners will get 15% off their first order at FrameBridge.com when they use my promo code HOWNOT. And if you happen to live in New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Philadelphia, Boston, or Chicago, you can stop by an actual FrameBridge store to work with one of their designers in person. I used FrameBridge to create very unique gallery walls of baby photos in each of my kids' rooms. They're very cool, and I could not be happier. Get started today. To frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift, go to FrameBridge.com and use promo code HOWNOT to save an additional 15% off of your first order. Go to framebridge.com, promo code how not. Again, framebridge.com, promo code how not. I'm hoping in podcasts like this that I persuade listeners to think differently about the nature versus nurture debate. It's no longer a debate. We all we we appreciate that it's usually both, but for some people, the genetic underpinning can be so strong that even the wonderful environment cannot necessarily undo it. Now, had they known to implement some of these very serious programs that we've talked about, you know, like send them to one of these places, give them, you know, all of these, these, all these brain exercises that we know that, that the treatments, the biofeedback, had they been able to jump in and do that, who knows? Maybe Landrigan would not have followed the fate of his father and grandfather, but... We do know that for him, it 
it wasn't an environmental cause uh, com- combining necessarily with the genes. It seems like the genes alone were acting, at least as far as Landrigan and everybody else says, he was he had a great, great life. Right. Um, but I, as I said, I want us to think of it as a combination. And um, we, we prefer, one of the reasons we prefer to think of it more caused by environment than genes is because we like to have control. Right. We think, but that's because we think of genes and biology as immutable. We, we get to control our environments, <laughs> but we don't, good point. we don't get to control our genes. So it's so much nicer as a parent to be like, oh, well, my kids aren't abused or molested, therefore they will be fine. And I wish it were that simple. But again, I propose that we think of genetic and biological differences as important and powerful, but also not complete destiny. Somebody actually just was talking the other day, asked them, oh, are your um, grandkids going to have kids? And he said, oh, well, um, my granddaughter-in-law is schizophrenic. And so they don't think that they want to have children to pass along that Mm -hmm. gene. Okay. Okay. So if you have a first degree relative with schizophrenia, you know, a sibling or a parent, you are, it's, whereas you go from 1% chance of having schizophrenia up to 10%. But you're still 90% chance you won't. Yeah. But I'm saying, like, if you now, if we knew, oh, this person, okay, this person has kind of like a, you know, very bad murder disposition, should not have children. <laughs> Interestingly, obviously, schizophrenic is more than just genetic. Otherwise, we would see it in a very clear right. pedigree. But there's some other research that having a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia and then having the mom have a flu in the second trimester of a pregnancy can somehow trigger it. So I, we are getting way off topic, but right, any, right, anytime okay. I can remember a fun fact, I'm going to throw yeah. it in. <laughs> so Landrigan's case is a strong argument for the genetic influence. Right. Um, we can be born with very intense tendencies toward a particular behavior, including violence, but that doesn't mean it's cemented in the future. Okay. okay. So social psychologists get very upset when we talk about these genetic and biological um, influences because they tend to focus on trauma and, and childhood and parenting. But let's actually look at the data because yes, those things have influence. The genes have just as, as much. And okay. let's talk about it. So how do we do that? How do we observe and isolate the genetic components of crime? The best studies are identical twins who are separated at birth because by doing that, you essentially get two genetically identical human beings who are raised in different environments. As such, any similarity in their behavior would likely be genetic, right? And any differences would largely be environmental. Okay. So obviously we do not separate twins anymore. And like that, that's not an adoptive practice. You try to keep the, the twins together, thankfully. But we right. do have loads of research based on adoption and twin studies in general, not necessarily separated at birth. And we do have some, some very strong studies of the twins who were separated at birth. And I'm going to get into it. So I worked for, actually, my advisor and I started one of the largest twin studies. It was called the Southern California Twin Study at USC. And Adrian Rain, who is one of my mentors, whose book I always refer to as, you know, my Bible, the um, biological basis of, well, it's right here, right here in front of me, the anatomy of violence. <laughs> and I remember this. the biological roots of, of crime. So anyway, yeah. we started this program. I wrote my dissertation off of the data. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about adoption and twin studies. There are huge studies all around the world that use these specific research designs to try to understand how much of a trait is influenced by genes, if at all. Some traits aren't. Conversely, these studies, are they show us how much of the trait is strictly environment, right? Because we're looking at, we're mathematically measuring in large populations of people the genes in the environment. Here's how. Once we know that a trait is unrelated to the environment, and it can be, or only related to the environment, then we can get to work. But spoiler alert, most traits are both. But we can focus on how much of any particular trait is genetic and how much is environmental and how much is your shared environment at home versus your individual environment, your peer groups and other things outside the home. So in Landrigan's case, he is born into a very violent family, but he is removed and raised by a loving, nurturing family. Almost immediately, yeah. I mean, he did have eight months with his right. mom, but right. there was no evidence that anything had gone wrong there. And no dad. Yeah. And the, the mom isn't criminal. Right. He's removed from that violent environment. He did, I mean, his dad, he never sees again. And um, his mom's not criminal, but she only had him eight months. His, bio, I mean, his adoptive family is great. Despite this, he still becomes a killer. 
Adoption studies have looked at this with huge numbers of adoptees because we cannot hang our hat on Landrigan alone. And we're going to dive into that in a bit. But first, we're going to go back to the twin studies. Okay. Twin studies are this great design to understand how much of any trait like violence is genetic. And here's how we do it. Identical twins, as I said, share 100% of their genes. Fraternal twins share only 50% of their genes, just like regular siblings, except they just happen to be born at the same time. So with any trait, rating ability, violence, we can measure how similar the identical twins are to each other and compare that to how similar the fraternal twins are to each other. Does that make sense? Do, yeah, but do identi- identical twins have the same DNA and everything? Yes, that's why I said they have 100% of the same genes. 100%. So again, in a, in a crime... You couldn't tell which one did did the crime, right? There's some my- mitochondrial DNA that can be different, but no, if you're looking at straight, you know, 46 genes, like uh, 46 right. chromosomes and the genes that are on it, and yeah, no, it's okay. gonna it's gonna be the same. There are mutations that can happen. There are some that you know some very negligible differences, but for okay. all, in- I mean, that that's why there's law and orders written about it because right. yes, they're for our for all intents and purposes, they are clones really yeah uh, with some exceptions but fraternal twins and most twins are fraternal only eight percent of twins are identical most twins are fraternal and parents i suggest you get buccal swab analysis to see if your twins are identical or fraternal you can do some other tests like oh did they get the teeth exact same time walk at the exact same time get their periods at the exact same time but just have them swabbed and if it's a boy and a girl they are not identical i get that all the time I had people come into the study and they're like, oh, they're identical. I'm like, hmm, how do I break it to her? <laughs> Moving on. Do you see now we have math we can work with. We can isolate. Right. This group shares 50% of their genes. This group shares 100. So if identical twins are as similar to their identical twins as fraternal twins are to their fraternal twins, and it's about the same, then it's environment. But if this group is super similar to each other, and this group is only kind of similar to each other, you know, whatever trait we're looking at, handedness, right. we have a good idea that it's genes. Right. Do you see how that works? Yep. Okay. This is exactly what we did at the Southern California Twin Project. We studied a multitude of skills, traits, behaviors. We had them in there for days. We looked at thousands of 9 to 11-year-old twin pairs and, like I said, studied them over actual years. Like, they came in more than just once. And I had to learn structural equation modeling to interpret the data that is very fancy and complicated mathematical analysis with models and mind your business if you see me working on fifth grade math now with my kid because (laughs) you'd never know I could ever have done sophisticated advanced math now Um, my skills have faded but that's all I did for many many years and one thing that was found from this study and many many others this we were just replicating other people's findings with this trait Antisocial behavior in this age range is 40 to 50% heritable. Really? That, that number shot way up when we combined reports of antisocial behavior. So we had parent report, individual report, the kids telling on themselves, and care, caregiver report, individual report, and teacher report. And when you smush them all together, then it's even, it looks even more like genes. What qualifies as antisocial behavior? What would... So d- different studies look at different things, but it's all, you know, aggression, hitting, stealing, okay. lying. It's all the things when you have a, a really naughty, naughty kid yeah. is going in the wrong okay. direction. It's okay. not... Yeah. No, by the way, um, those even softer misbehavior, that, that's, that's 50%, you know, heritable too. Okay. Now, I want to say something about a heritable, like a statistic like that. These are population statistics. Well, what this means is it is not any one individual, 50% of their behavior is genes. What it means is when looking at the variance of violence in a population of humans, so from very little violence to this violence, when you're explaining the difference, 50% of that difference, around 50, 40 to 60% of that difference is explained by genetic properties. And the rest is explained by environment. That's important to understand. I'm not talking about, it's not an individual statistic. It's a population statistic. So when you look at a population of, you know, I don't know, Los Angeles, and you look at all the people in Los Angeles and the, the the variance in crime, some places there's no crime, some places there's lots of crime. If you look at the variance of crime, 50% of it can be explained by this. 
Got it. So like your median. Roughly. roughly. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it does not apply to a single person. For some people, their route to violence can be totally environmental. For some people, it can be right. totally genetic. But if you smush it all together, right. about, about half of it can be explained by genes. Now, the, what we found in that study is consistent with many studies with various types of aggression and antisocial behavior. This was not a one-off. And in those rare studies of identical twins separated at birth, same result, 41%. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Um, wow. So what do we do about this? You're, <laughs> for all y'all who are getting fussy about there being a genetic influence, I suggest we look at the bright side, which is that means 50% of the variants is not explained by genes. Glass half full. Glass is half full. It's shared by, indiv- it's shared in individual, it's caused by uh, shared in individual environments. Yep. It, okay, but then you're getting mad again because it turns out <laughs> that a lot of the inter- uh, environmental influence that's outside the home is really influential, even at nine years old. Well, the, the they spend a lot of time outside the home, yes. In fact, children's peers at even nine years old their, the influence is, is eating up 33% of the variants. Ugh. Yeah. Yep. So the, the least influential at, at least these ages is the, the, the shared environment, the home environment. Yep. Now your home, your parenting is influencing their individual environments. Yep. I mean, you do, you do choose where you put them to school. You are picking where, you know, so right. to an extent right. what they're doing after school and who they're doing it with. Right. I was going to bring up a question, but I don't know if it's relevant. Um, like, for example, I'm not a twin. My sister and I are two years almost exactly apart. How different are we? Okay. So. Right? So that's my question. We're raised in the same environment, but I'm like the total nerd. She was the total party person. To me, that's a trip in itself. How different even siblings can be, but we're not twins. So you so. guys are a great case study. I've known you for decades and decades. Yeah. And not that old. You, you were decades. decades. <laughs> you guys are, you are very, very different. You can, you can talk all you want, Michelle, about 50% of differences being inherited, but in any one individual, it's not necessarily the case. And I think it's good to remind people of that. Like, look, these are broad studies and they are very important for us to understand. They're important for us to understand so that we can do something about it, right? Yeah. I'm right. like hoping this really does have an effect for future generations. Yeah. And, and peer groups matter. You know, we're, right. we're these studies and they're replicated robust over and over and over again. I never come on and just talk about a one-off that could have been. I don't do that because I know that one study can't, it can, it can open up the door. Like it can you, help. Right. you see it any, in any proper research article, it says future studies should be done. No researcher worth his or her weight is going to be like, oh, I found capital T truth. No, right. we're always continuing to research. But right. I'll tell you, I'm actually going to give you an idea of how much this has been studied. Again, not one, we cannot look at a single individual criminal and be like, well, 50% of this is heritable. <laughs> we, in general, we know that of criminal behavior across a population, about 50% of the differences between not being criminal and being the worst criminal, about 50% of that difference is explained by genes. This is a very scary finding for parents and aunties. Let's, let's make sure that, you know, we talk about all the ways that we know this. There's adoption right. studies too, and I mentioned it. There are caveats to every study design. For example, in twin studies, there can be an argument that they actually underestimate the genetic influence on traits and behaviors because mathematically, any error in the equation is assigned to the non-shared environment part of the equation. Oh. If you imagine a model, like here's the twin and here's the other twin and here's their reaction to each other and here's the outcome. And then there's three balls up above each twin and it's ACE, like genes, shared environment, individual environment plus error. Any error gets thrown in there, not into the genes. So Got there's it. an argument, there's an argument that it could be slightly more of a genetic um, influence. However, it can be argued that Twin studies overestimate genetic influence because of the equal environment's assumption. In this design, we are assuming that fraternal twins are treated equally, as as equally, so their shared environment is the same as each other, as identical twins, but identical twins actually might have a closer shared environment because people treat them more similarly. Right. But I want to make everybody feel better about that because... The studies of identical twins reared apart handles that problem. And those studies also came up with the same amount of variation, 41%. And even if they are, even if there is some error here and it's it's a little, the estimations are a little higher or a little low, it doesn't really matter because at rates this high, it's negligible. Like it it matters, but 
is it 40% or 50% or 42%? Like we just know it, it freaking matters. Right. So the adoption studies give us more information about environmental and genetic influences on behavior. So that's a totally different design. Right. And it too isolates genes, right? Because you're being raised by, by people with whom you share no genes. Landrigan is the golden standard, the golden example of the strength of your DNA. Caution must be taken when examining just one case, as we said. We need lots of Landrigans. And you said that earlier. Do you have any studies with lots of Landrigans? (laughs) Yes, we do. To study is if this intense influence of criminal parent on offspring, does that exist scientifically, mathematically over groups of people? You know, how do we know that Landrigan wasn't just some funky coincidence? Right. It's not. Okay. Right. I just want to say it. But it could have been. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. So what does it mean if the child becomes criminal, has biological criminal parents who they never met? So to examine the studies are designed to look at children of criminal biological parents who are adopted away and raised by nonviolent parents, such as Landrigan, but we're going to look at thousands of them. That group will be compared to groups of non the offspring of non-criminal biological parents who are adopted and raised, adopted away and raised by also non-criminal. So in one group, you have criminal biological parent raised by non-criminal adoptive parent. In the other group, you have non-criminal biological parent and non-criminal adoptive parent. Do you get it? Yeah, there should be no obstacle with the second group. Right. In they should have they should have just like the normal base rate of crime exactly. that you'd accept. Yeah. That's your baseline, right? Right. Yeah. So if influences on criminal behavior were purely environmental and not genetic, then we would expect that the children of both groups would have the same rate of criminal behavior in adulthood. Because if it's just the environment, the luck of you, the luck of the draw, right. the environment you're right. in, and those two groups of environments shouldn't have anything wildly different from them because they were assigned only based on the biological parent. Right. So they're randomly assigned otherwise. The, the, the yeah. tra- there's no reason to believe the traits are different otherwise. Um, conversely, if there is a genetic influence on criminal behavior, you're going to expect the offspring of the criminal biological parents to become criminal at a higher rate. There have been several studies examining this, but Adrian Rain, one of my mentors at USC, describes it really well in his book. And he takes um, the study of Sarnoff Mednick. Sarnoff Mednick was also at USC. He's groundbreaking. He's one of the first people to look at all of this. I think he's actually the one who convinced Adrian Rain um, to come to USC to study. He did this study in Denmark. Dr. Mednick did. And the results are fascinating. And I remember reading them. And I think I typed like typed out letters to them, like, hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm graduating college, but I'd really love to work with you. And, um, and, and Adrian Rain took me under his wing, and I ended up getting in and studying under Laura Baker. But those guys, these guys are godlike to me. So what did that study show? The one that I just described that Mendick did, taking biolog- kids from biological criminals raised by non-criminals and, you know, biological, non-criminal raised by non-criminal. The children whose biological parents were criminal, but who were raised by non-criminal parents, were more likely to become criminal than the other group, as we'd expect. So that's consistent with there being some sort of genetic influence on crime. The relationship was strong and linear, which means, what I mean by that is, the more criminal convictions that the biological parents had, the more criminal convictions the adopted away offspring had. Interesting. No matter the environment no matter the environment, whether we want it to be or not, there is a genetic predisposition to crime. And this has been replicated over and over in countries all over the world. And one such study looked at 43,000 adoptees and 1.2 million controls. So it's not a mathematical error anymore. Now, some people might say, well, what about selective placement? Um, You know, and time spent with the biological mom before she gave him away. So most of these studies control for that. They, they can mathematically take those variables to and test. Does it change with those in or without it? Does it change if, if, the, um, if the, it was an adoption agency that tried to place you with people who were like your bio parents? Right. All of that's been controlled for. So, <laughs> of course, there are limitations. To, and I would not be worth my weight in anything, much less should be talking on a freaking podcast. There's limitations <laughs> to any research design. But I think Adrian Rain addresses this perfectly when he, when he writes. I want to quote him because I think this to me, it's like, okay, come on. We have to at least admit this. Probably th- there's some truth to this, right? 
He writes, participants in more than 100 genetic studies of antisocial behavior have ranged from 19 months to 70 years old. They cover the period from the Great Depression to the present. They represent many different Western nations, including Australia, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the United States. They have a wide variety of measures of antisocial behavior. We're not all looking at the same tools. They are made up of twin studies, adoption studies, and just sibling designs. They are also, they also include large scale studies that represent the general population and they use advanced quantitative modeling techniques. The studies of yesteryear stand up in the studies today. Again, as much as they have years and years and years of studies, as, as much as social psychologists and parents and you and me, and we all hate this, I promise you there's greatness in knowing it because it's not immutable. We right. can dive in early. If you know that, and then you adopt a kid, and it's acting different, it's acting like problematic, you're like, do, 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 what's that podcast? What can I do here? Okay, they're doing this and this and this. I'm going to research that. What does it mean if your child is, you know, starting fires? They are, <laughs> you know, starting, they're, they're aggressive with their sibling. They're aggressive at school. Dive in. You get to dive in because now you know you're, it's going to go beyond, possibly there's a genetic influence working here and it's going to go beyond just you know making sure that their bedtime stays the same right. and that you hug them enough hugging and you them you can have yeah but you can have an influence once you're that's why and it's funny you keep saying that people are going to get mad about things how can you ever get mad about having more information knowledge is always power well so yes at, it might not be the answer that you want but it actually at least you get armed with more and more information and the power to maybe do something or try to do something well, I think it's because we put so much freaking effort into raising these kids mm-hmm. that it's really hard to hear that. <laughs> so well, you know what? It gives us too much credit when they do something well. Like this this incorrect assumption that perfect home lives make perfect kids, right. that gives us too much credit when something goes right because we're just kind of quietly giving them genes that we don't right. even know about. But it also gives us too much blame when things go wrong. So when we recognize their shit behind our control, there are genes working here, we can intervene. Beyond just making sure we're hugging them enough and telling them I love you enough, we can actually go, all right, we're going to look at, for this type of personality, a consequence-based home life will not work. It has to be reward-based, consistent. Right. You know, we're going to have to... Previous, right. Yes. Okay. It could be that this person, this kid really needs some help with executive function and, and all of the impulse control. Perhaps right. he, there's just such an immaturity in his frontal lobe. Maybe he needs medication. Like There's right. so many avenues, but to not to ignore the possibility that... There's genes happening that you don't know about. Um, and it's also, it, I, it, I'm a big proponent of knowing as much um, about your adopted children as you possibly can. Yep. For medical reasons and, you know, just their trajectories as well. As right. you said, information's power. Yep. I'm going to leave you with a quote before we dive into just some personal discussion about this from Jeffrey Landrigan's biological father, Mr. Daryl Hill, who was sitting on death row. And even he says... I don't think there can be any doubt in anyone's mind that he, meaning his son Jeffrey Landrigan, was fulfilling his destiny. I believe that when he was conceived, what I was, he became. The last time I saw him, he was a brand new baby in a bed, and underneath his mattress, I had two thirty-eight pistols and Demerol. That's what he was sleeping on. And he confessed this. Pretty poignant. Wow. For a death row inmate to say, that's what he was sleeping on. And by that, I think he means Landrigan was given a genetic predisposition for crime. He was not at all surprised about how his biological son turned out. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So I love talking to somebody like you because I, as you can see, I'm like, (gasps) I'm like a child. (laughs) I love this. But I get a lot of pushback. Um, Sometimes, like, I remember seeing this stuff in my shows, and, and some people would say, and I understand this, they would say, this is giving an excuse to criminals. And I, I don't want it to be thought of that way. Um, I feel like it's giving us power to, to understand. And there are so many children who need the protective factor of a loving foster home or a loving adoptive home. They need it because that might be the only difference. But now in that loving adoptive home, you can also look up and implement interventions exactly for things that might happen outside of your control that might this, be working tacitly in their dna this is i get how it could be you know again like you said i am not a parent so but i look at these children as though they were my own yep and to me again i'm 
I'm in the second bucket that you talk about. I just feel like knowledge is power and you, I feel like you do have to get over, you know, your own head. You know, I can do something. I can do something. The second you see something, there is no harm. And this is, we're always trying to get into our society. Now there shouldn't be a stigma for, you know, Mm -hmm. certain mental illnesses or certain issues you have to overcome. But in learning from your podcast, like the biofeedback, the omega-3, like that's information I did not have before that would be amazing. Like if if my nephew all of a sudden, he were like lighting cat's tails on fire, you bet your booty he'd be going to a doctor and going to Boys Town or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Because even if he was born with certain horrible traits, we can help. And he's so lucky because he has your eyes on him too. He's got his mom, his dad. Oh, yeah. I understand that I do come at it much more logically as my sister schooled me just the other day. She's like, oh, can you just come live with us or take one of my children? Because you look at I said, I don't look at it from an emotional aspect. I look at it five years down the road, Mm -hmm. you know, or like how do these kids interact with us versus how they interact also with their peers? Because I get, you know, I see, I see my niece and she talks to her mom horrifyingly. And then she goes and talks to somebody else's mom, pleasant as pie. You know, and it's just, I'm like, what, what is that dynamic? So there's that part too, you know, I'm not the parent. So then she never treats me like that. So it's how your kids, like, you know, this, your daughter loves to beat up on you. (laughs) And then she's nice as pie to us. If somebody saw what happens, they'd be like, and you're going to have a parenting podcast, Michelle? Like, uh, but to me, she's just, she has a very strong personality and I secretly Mm -hmm. love it, you know, but it's, that's that give and take of like, okay, what's okay. And what's not okay. And why they beat up on their mom is the worst. I don't understand it at all. It's so Well, and and you bring up an interesting point too, points that I'd like to touch on. One is um, when you have children like your sister's daughter and like my daughter who Mm -hmm are tougher with us, but forward facing, forward facing the outside world, their teachers, their other parents, they're good. It's, it's, it's good. It's good because they can control themselves. Unfortunately, their real self is probably the one they're showing their mom because they're like, ah, but this person has to love me no matter what. I'm going to show you my ugly underbelly. Um, You know, there are scientists, there are female scientists who have been involved in the nascency of almost every great discovery we've ever made, they rarely get the credit, but right. I promise you they weren't fun to raise. Right. Um, and, and so I do look at the challenges of a smart, strong-willed daughter, and I say to myself, we need people like her, just like we need the people-pleasing other types, too, right. who are easy to raise um, and wonderful people. We need Me. them all. You. Oh, right. Allison Perfect is what she was called <laughs> growing up. Allison Perfect, because, you know, Allison and her sister are, are quite different. Um, I mean... You, you couldn't look more different on paper, but personality-wise, like, I love you both. Like, I would pick both of you over and over and over again. But within you guys, I can see how you guys might not have, have connected. Well, I think about my parents. I think about the parents and what they used to say to us and other, you know, parents listening out there might see this too is, uh, again, I was the first and I was quiet in the beginning. You know, it was just easy. I didn't do anything. I was, a little, you know, I was a nerd. And I kept going and everything. And then when they had my sister and she started exhibiting all these bombastic traits, they were like, they looked at me and they're like, well, you didn't prepare us at all. And so they did. They felt, you know, like thrown back. They were on their heels the entire time. Like, I love when people have more than one kids and or they take credit the first kid. I did this. Like, my daughter's right. such an easy traveler. And oh, it's because I'm flexible. And then the second kid's born. He's a, he was an easy kid, but he yes. could not get be out of his crib. Like he had to have his routine. So you realize that you have to parent to yep. the child, the child each you child. have. Yep. Your and strict mono parenting isn't going to work on each kid. Right. That's just so funny. Cause you said like, and, and especially people listening to it's if they have, uh, if they're younger, you know, and you just don't know what to expect. Like, you know, and I just laugh about it. I'm like, oh my God, the, the trials and tribulations that people have to go through when I s- secretly love being the auntie from the outside and seeing, and I can come in and help and saying, oh, oh, let's, let's try to talk to, you know, mommy and see if we can fix this. So, and, and you being Allison Perfect and being the, the first one, like had they had your sister first, they might not have had a second one. Right. <laughs> Same with me. I was no walk in the park, you know, like I'm sure my parents were like, what the, what? My sister was much easier. And it's, it, I I think that if you look, and by the way, having an easy child or a difficult child does not mean they're going to end up successful or not successful. I'm just saying it takes all types to make the world go round. And, um, and, and you might have to alter parenting for each kid, especially if you're seeing these these wild differences. I mean, you're lucky enough to get a bunch of kids who are similar to each other. Good for you. Right. Um, I want listeners to also know that you have to do the research yourself. Like, what does it mean if your kid's doing this? What are interventions? Interventions for this. Look for interventions. Listen okay. to listen to people who are studying and, and trying to get it out there. And one of the complaints I had about academia is we have had all this research, 
for so long. And there is a tendency to be nervous to bring it out into the public because people don't know, is it going to stigmatize? Are people going to not know what to do with it? Are people going to take it as gospel when we haven't studied it enough yet? Right. But I'm at the point where I'm like, it's been out there long enough and people need to know it. Yes. Um, but I'm so glad you you talked about that. Like, you're not offended by knowing it's genes. No, because I think knowledge is power. That's pure. You know, that's exactly where it comes. I mean, it, it, the, the hard part is not knowing, you know? I, I don't like that we live in ignorance, so. But what does it mean, do you think, for parents when it's like you spend... The worst we feel any given day is when we have lost our cool with our kids. The best right. we feel is when our kid has done something great. Yeah. W- what do you think this, how this is going to land on parents when they hear like, by the way, half of what's happening in any particular trait, you can do nothing. You, you're not making that happen. You can do something about it. You can jump in and intervene if it's good or bad, but it's not parenting. When I hear, when I hear that, I would think that there is a little bit of a relief. You know, if you have a bad mm-hmm. one. And you're saying, oh, thank gosh, you know, like, I'm not all the way responsible for this. Mm -hmm. You know, I would think that would be my go to like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know. And now I can take or do my research and take him to the appropriate doctor. I love the biofeedback because back in like, you know, 80s and 90s, my dad went to biofeedback. And it, oh, it worked wonders. It was shocking, shocking. He would get very anxious about things, very stressed, Mm -hmm. and the news made him so mad back in the day, and he started going to biofeedback and calming down, and he'd put the earphones on and listen to these tapes, and all of a sudden, he'd be sound asleep. It worked (sighs) wonders, and the one thing, actually, they um, told him was to stop watching the news. There's Ah. like, you have a trigger, you know, so this is it, but the biofeedback was just, I don't know how they explain it, but to me, it was like, rewiring the way he responded to outside stimuli you know like if we were stressing him out he had a way to just reset he has a way to temporarily cope with the anxiety but he's also changing the actual structure and function of his brain so that he is permanently getting better if he's doing crazy true biofeedback when you mentioned it in a few podcasts like i was like oh no way like that and you talk about tools that's been out there for a while, but mm-hmm. I, that was the only situation I'd ever heard that term. Bio so if you, had, as, a ch- as a parent or an aunt or a grandparent, go and decide to do that with your child, you know what happens often? What? Teachers notice. Teachers make up something different at home. That's nice. what you get with biofeedback. Ooh. You get, if you keep it private within your family for whatever reason, I have heard so many people say, you know how I know it worked? Because the teacher called me and was like, what's going on? Interesting. Little Jimmy's not, you know, smacking everyone. Or, in biofeedback, by the way, works great for just maintaining attention. It's frontal right. lobe stuff, right? So just maintaining attention, you're just going to do better in school, right? Right. And that was an adult. You know, like, I always think about that. Like, he was a fully grown older man who, you know, was just stresses of life. It wasn't even, like, it's that, uh, you imagine sometimes somebody back, you know, put them in when they're eight. How great would that be? Before it all gets jumbled up here. Allison, I actually want to stop and say thank you so much for pointing out that how effective it was for a grown man to do it. Because, you know, I tend to focus on just the kids. And as you say, gosh, could you imagine if he was eight? But if you come across this at 40, 50, 60, do it anyway. But I think about the Landrigan thing. You know, it's like, unfortunately, those poor parents, those adoptive parents, didn't have any information. They didn't Mm -hmm. know, again, about probably... Their son, who they adopted, might have been, you know, minimal, and no one keeps track of the father, the genetic family. So I just that that would be hard, you know. And by the way, this was like seventies and eighties, like right. people didn't know, right? You know, and even still, know. right now, you're still struggling to get this information out to people. When in theory, like I said, biofeedback's been around for 20, 30 years, and then parents getting therapy, realizing mm. that whoa, I'm stuck, I'm not doing this, and so, you know. I've noticed a difference with people getting therapy and how they're mm-hmm. raising their children and calming down and understanding words and hearing trigger words and stepping out of the room when you're about to blow up. That kind of thing has been mm-hmm. hugely beneficial. Be an active learner, be in therapy as a parent and get the tools you need and, and address your own shit. Yeah. I mean, so you can do this. I know a couple of people have, who, you know, just as much older adults realizing I do need therapy and finally going and, and it's changed a lot about how they're not only behaving with uh, other adults, but their children. Well, thank you so much, Allison. You're, I mean, you're brilliant. You're always so much fun to talk to in life and now on a podcast. So thank you. I always felt before that I was weird being interested in these true crime things, but now I know that there's a huge audience out there though, that really takes an interest. 
And of course yours. We're, we're those unite. <laughs> right. And of course yours. I've been calling you doctor ever since the day you got your PhD. Yeah. So I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. I have, I have a great friend and supporter in you and thank you for coming on. This has been How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and we will see you soon. Thank you. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaseriokiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. History has got some pretty big mysteries. What happened to the Russian hikers who disappeared under mysterious circumstances at Dialov Pass? The colonists who seemingly just vanished from Roanoke Island? And what really happened to the Flannan Island lighthouse keepers? I'm Simon Whistler, and on my podcast, Decoding the Unknown, we try and decode the mysteries, what they really are, throwing out aliens and ghosts as an answer, and trying to find out the real history behind the mystery. Listen to Decoding the Unknown on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.